take any chances with a death threat. The torture I experienced from 2005 to 2010 in my loft and from 2010 to now can be broken down into treatments and stress factors. These are combinations of the torture techniques perfected by the CIA and other intelligence agencies around the world and were used to elicit information about every aspect of my life, from childhood to the current day. In 2014, new neuroweapon technologies were demonstrated on me, which I've learned from people like Dr. Duncan and other victims, required the terror associated with being kept hostage and tortured psychologically and physically. This section will describe in more detail what year to year, month to month, week to week, day to day, minute by minute, second by second, uh, voice to skull torture is really like. According to Shane O'Mara, breaking someone means subjecting a person to sufficiently prolonged stressors that substantial negative and enduring changes to his or her personality and behavior occur. The only reason I can attempt to attach to the constant breaking down of a human being's psyche during voice to skull torture treatments relates to the Pavlovian mindset of an experimental psychologist. Pavlov was interested in how animals' brains would rewire themselves after suffering emotional breakdowns. Once an animal was conditioned to salivate, electric shocks were administered until the mind fractured, which would erase its previous conditioning. This horrific treatment was used on Karen Wetmore in Vermont State Hospital. Her book, Surviving Evil, CIA Mind Control Experience in Vermont, details these atrocities. And there's a, a documentary called Real Stories, The CIA's Secret Experiments, uh, which is available on uh, YouTube uh, that includes an interview with Karen. And a link is provided to that documentary in uh, DBL below. I still don't understand the reason for torturing non-consensual human beings other than just being able to get away with it without having to tell or pay anybody. Doing any of this to a human non-consensually is blood science. And as you listen and or read to my testimony, you'll understand why I'll never stand in the same room with a person involved in this science. I'm alive for the purposes of putting this science in a coffin. The way that scientists involved in this industry put victims and, uh, and in a couple cases, their victims in a coffin. But in order to put uh, the purpose of the torture into context, I'll provide a, a brief explanation of the science underlying the blood science voice to skull is involved in. The data being gathered during these torture experiments are the evoked potentials of targeted individuals which helps government neurosciences create neural weapons. Evoked potentials are the spikes in neural activity read by uh, remotely sensing the brain's electromagnetic fields. These spikes correspond to the countless patterns of neural, neuronal activity in the brain, which includes motor neurons, sensory neurons, interneurons, and about 10,000 other specialized neurons. Gathered over the course of years, these patterns of evoked potentials provide the vo voice to scholars with an overall map of your mind with which they can eventually manipulate your brain, including the movement of your body. Beyond the collection of evoked potentials, which can be used for simple things like transmitting voices into your head or triggering the feeling of pain in your body, is the manipulation of a target's various brain states. Here's a brief rundown of what they're basically doing. The activity of neurons generates electric currents, and when neural ensembles, large groups of neurons, is synchronized, they create oscillations which can be measured using an EEG. These oscillations equate to various brain states. Fluctuating frequencies of oscillations are categorized into general bands, gamma, beta, alpha, theta, delta, plus mu, sigma, and sensimotor rhythm. These oscillations have been shown to correlate with emotional responses, motor control, and a number of cognitive functions, including information transfer, perception, and memory. For example, neural oscillations, in particular theta activity, are extensively linked to memory function and coupling between theta a gamma activity is considered to be vital for memory functions, including episodic memory. Changing EEG signals during sleep indicate a relationship between the frequency of neural oscillations and cognitive states, including awareness and consciousness. Brain entrainment refers to the way two or more independent, 
autonomous oscillators with differing rhythms and frequencies when situated in a context or at a proximity where they can interact with each other for long enough, influence each other mutually, and adjust until both oscillate with the same frequency. The concept of entrainment was first identified by Christian Huygens in 1665, who discovered the phenomenon during an experiment with pendulum clocks. He set them in motion and found that when he returned the next day, the sway of their pendulums had all synchronized. Such entrainment occurs because small amounts of energy are transferred between the two systems when they are out of phase in such a way as to produce negative feedback. As they assume a more stable phase relationship, the amount of energy gradually reduces to zero, with the system of greater frequency slowing down and the other speeding up. <clears throat> this information can be found on Wiki. The discovery of entrainment motivated government agencies to experiment with the entrainment of brain waves to an external ex ex um, electromagnetic stimulus. Voice to skull torture experiments are what resulted. By invoking fear, stress, anxiety, hopelessness, suicidal ideation, uh, hate, anger, and every other emotion, including sexual stimulation in a targeted individual, scientists can capture the, the corresponding oscillations and evoke potentials and mix together very evil cocktails made up of various emotional states, combined with the evoked potentials representing pain in the body, thoughts, emotions, memories, etc. The combinations they can come up with are endless, meaning the amount of complex neural activity, whether it's something relatively simple like a voice, which is just the electrical activity in the auditory cortex, which again they can read remotely and send to you remotely, uh, to a mashup of every psychological disaster, uh, emotional state, and or series of pain inputs they've ever captured or created. Uh, this can be transmitted directly uh, into a person's mind. Neural weapons combine all of this data and convert it back to the extremely precise frequencies that are specific to the victim. Uh, to a dead or tortured victim, however, these uh, very precise and one-of-a-kind individualized frequencies are nothing more than evidence of a crime. Once these evoked potentials are captured through a large enough sampling of the population, Intelligence agencies and researchers from all over the planet have everything they need to destroy lives without leaving any powder residue uh, on their hands or any marks. All of this could uh, have been done through consensual testing. The reason why scientists uh, or why um, uh, government scientists and neuroscientists and psychologists uh, are uh, using non-consensual um, victims is because it's cheap because they don't have to sign agreements. They don't, uh, and if there's permanent damage, which there is, uh, it's proven uh, from psychological torture, that they can't, that the uh, subjects uh, can't go back to the government and claim damages. And what's hard to fathom for me is that anybody could take part in uh, a science experiment utilize, using non-consensual victims. If they did, they were brainwashed into believing that the evoked potentials that come from a non-consensual victim are somehow different from the evoked potentials that would come from a consensual victim. You could set up an experiment in a facility where a person, a consensual test subject, uh, is asked to commit to a, a two-week um, experiment where, that will, where they will be locked in the facility. Once they're locked in the facility, or even told they're locked in the facility, then uh, you could create all sorts of, of, of scare tactics that could lead them to believe that their girlfriend's screwing somebody else or their mother died of a heart attack or that they're in fact going to be killed. Uh, you know, something happened. You could create all of these brain states and all of these, um, you know, uh, all of this anxiety and stress in a consensual victim. And those experiences would be terrible. Uh, for some reason, uh, the government is using non-consensual victims and for, uh, again, for anybody who's, who has participated in these uh, experiments, um, uh, you're a brainwashed idiot for doing something like this to a human being. We all know about uh, the APA, American Psychological Association, and its uh, psychologists working with the military. The military is the largest employer of psychologists in the country, and in order to conduct uh, you know, research like this, experimental psychology, you would have to have military uh, psychologists participating in it. The uh, experience 
of being um, binded to non-stop conversations feels like being permanently stuck on a telephone call that monopolizes your uh, attention 100% of the time. The beaming of the conversations directly into, into your brain and their life and death content focuses your attention on them like a laser. Dealing with them while trying uh, to operate in the outside world feels like having to entertain a secondary consciousness consisting of four or more people always tugging on your shirt. Binding only allows you to take in their stimuli, threats, pointless conversations, anything. So over time your memories are lost and your knowledge about almost everything disappears. I couldn't tell you a single thing I learned in elementary, high school, college, my 20s, 30s, or 40s. The books you've read are completely erased. The movies you've watched are gone in a few hours, and your vocabulary is reduced to practically nothing. Your, your uh, working memory is reduced to about four or uh, five uh, words, making it impossible to remember the previous sentence you read or keep more than one idea in your head. When I read, I highlight 80% of the book, believing it will help me navigate more quickly to the general information that a person would normally have in their memory. This is how most of my books look. I'm also having big problems with structural thinking, such as working out math problems, and I'm a finance major. The scenarios which set up stressful events, which provide the mercenary scientists the evoked potentials they're paid to measure, are what I call treatments. Each treatment is a ramp up to freedom, which is always ripped away and the evoked potential saved. This, these scenarios or treatments, like a soap opera, have to be designed in a way that lures the victim in again and again, despite the last episode having ended in the absolute dematerialization of hope. Hope is an opportunity for release, which the torturers or perpetrators spend, spend weeks building up. Hope could be the buildup of a believable scenario in which a female voice discoller speaks kindly to you or feigns interest in your personality or takes your side in a conversation with the other voice discollers for weeks and weeks only to flip on a dime and rip your heart out by saying she's now fucking one of the voice discollers or the voice discull master. Hope could be the voice discoller who put you into the torture in the first place, but is now finally softening up to the idea of letting you go but then changes his mind at the last minute and reaffirms that you've been sentenced to death or permanent voice to skull. I've been through hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these treatments. The only thing you can do to combat treatments is to maintain a baseline of zero believability about everything you hear. And as I'll talk about, that is impossible to do because everything in voice to skull is translated into your brain so you're already thinking about it. It's already in your mind. You can't close your ears. It's in your mind, so you have to process it, even if the believability uh, level is, uh, is 0.001%, you still have to process it as something that might be true. Within each of these treatments are stress factors that are woven into the storyline for the purposes of invoking stress, fear, and anxiety at will. Like an electric shock, torturers uh, uh, think of them as single doses of stress hope, uh, in hopes of measuring your brain's ability to reconcile its emotions after the event. Administered subjectively, these doses are always increased to their milgram maximum by torturers who are simply not equipped to stop themselves. People react to stress differently, and if a torturer believes you can handle more stress, they'll increase stress factors or stressors uh, in doses that are uh, inhumane. As Shanomara writes, experiencing stress causes the release of stress hormones, cortisol and catecholamines, such as noradrenaline. Stress hormones provoke and control the fight or flight response, catecholamines. If overly prolonged, the fight or flight response results in compromised brain function. As we will see, prolonged stress can even result in tissue loss in certain brain regions. This quote from Shane O'Mara is kind of preparing his reader for the, uh, for the, the real kind of um, uh, thesis of his book, uh, which is that uh, enhanced interrogation uh, uh, does more to destroy the memories of uh, captives uh, than it does to reveal um, you know, information that could be helpful. Here's an example of how stress factors or stressors are woven into a treatment. And a treatment is a long-term um, scenario or a story 
that's um, built up in, uh, for the purposes of leading you to, to believe that you can, um, you know, that you'll be released from the torture uh, if you, you know, um, answer their questions and follow through, you know, follow their proceedings. So uh, a, here's an example, a torturer you haven't heard of, um, you know, a, a, a new voice um, uh, jumps in and, and starts speaking on your behalf, indicating to the group that he's inclined to take your side. He or she uh, has now started to defend you, but the voice to scholar society has its own set of rules, which require a unanimous decision by its membership before motioning to acquit you. In order to make your case, your champion must review your life story again for the entire group and clarify some things. You used the term black instead of African-American last year, and some of the members are African-American and have taken offense to your misdeed. Another member indicates that she took offense to your use of the term oriental last year when you were really trying to highlight Asian stereotypes in the 50s. Now your release hinges on the circumstances behind these two stress factors and your high school car crash, your Mexican-American group of friends, and your honesty because two years ago you admitted to cheating on a test. Now the voice to scholars have five plus completely unrelated stress factors that they can hang you by. All you can do to, is to explain the circumstances behind every question until everyone appears to be satisfied, every one of the voice to scholars. Throughout the entire experience, treatments and stress factors were meticulously designed to invoke fear and stress, which have permanent physiological and psychological consequences. A living schematic of your life is maintained, which allows the torturers to stay organized and go in and out of treatments and stressors, predicting your every move. The schematic or omniscience, also referred to as hyper game theory by Dr. Duncan, allows complex treatments to be created, utilizing all of the what ifs available to the uh, victim. It's choose your own adventure. No matter what you say or do, the schematic will always be expanded to include, include every stress applicable to your particular situation. The constant back and forth between the belief that you'll soon be freed and the absolute fear of death or extension of torture is the razor's edge where perpetrators try to keep you. In every situation, confidence is built up in, built up in the victim and then ripped away the razor's edge is the maximum level of believable psychological stress they can inflict on a person. So stress factors have to be continually added as your brain works out the logic required to bring you back to baseline, which is your only protection against the stress. This stuff is done uh, precisely to keep you in, 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 uh, in a constant state of panic. Uh, the, the, the tool set uh, becomes larger and larger as this torture goes on. They uh, introduced uh, new uh, torture techniques and new um, psychotronic uh, waves that were doing a whole lot more than just communicating voices in my head. Every one of these stress factors um, has to be talked through for hours and hours just to keep the treatment moving forward toward what you believe might be a successful ending. You can shop at the supermarket or try to go out with friends, but you're just a shell of a person to the outside world because you're always thinking through the current treatment and its stress factors. No matter how well you handle the individual stress factors, treatments always end with an emotional thud. This sadistic form of psychological torture was reportedly used against Amanda Berry, Michelle Knight, and Gina De Jesus by Ariel Castro. One of the cruelest things Castro did, Berry and De Jesus told ABC News, was play mind games with them. Castro would play mind games such as leaving the door tantalizingly ajar to tempt the girls to run, only to shut them in their faces, taunting them. He played their feelings against each other by giving one of the girls a new outfit, but not the others. He also played Russian roulette with De Jesus. All three were chained, starved, and tortured. One of the uh, treatments uh, my torturers uh, designed and spent months building up with me it had to do with uh, um, spending time with Michelle, Gina, and Amanda after this was over. The torturers would tell me that they, uh, that uh, Michelle, Gina, and Amanda wanted to live with me because they could really only uh, open up to another torture victim. They told me that all three wanted to have sex with me and that sex with them would be good for our recoveries. 
Nothing is off limits to the voice to scholars. The tortures could be anybody. White supremacists, evangelists, atheists, white wingers, left wingers, pedophiles, PhDs, blue bloods, laypersons, capitalists, communists, cultists, fundamentalists, Satanists, serial killers, millennials, generation Xers, people you know, people you've never met. Without knowing anything about them, you're put in the position of working through every aspect of the treatments and stress factors without, without antagonizing a single member of the group. Your baseline tells you never to believe anything they're saying, but you'll do almost anything to be released. You can't ignore what they're saying because you're actually binded to their conversations and because your brainwaves are entrained, your memory, vocabulary, and general ability to impress declines the longer you're tortured. After five, eight, 12 years, your thoughts of ever being released disappear to almost nothing. So you participate in hopes of earning small victories, like making them contemplate their afterlife for a moment, which is better than being screamed at or threatened or shocked for hours at a time. Maintaining their anonymity is the key to the torturer's ability to act sadistically and keep you in this constant state of fear and unrelenting suspense. Torturers follow a very strict protocol, which prohibits them from sharing any personal information whatsoever, which is designed for one reason, to protect their anonymity. They don't reveal anything that could lead you to them because they'll always know, they always know you'll seek revenge. Torturers never use their real names. They prefer to use uh, their victims' names or the victims' friends' names or celebrity names. Torturers never reveal uh, what they look like, uh, what their nationalities are, unless they're trying to uh, imitate somebody during a treatment. Torturers never reveal uh, where they live, where they grew up, uh, or where they, where they went to school. Torturers never discuss anything having to do with their families, especially their children. Torturers never talk about what they did that weekend or what their upcoming plans are. Torturers never talk about their favorite places to go, favorite foods, favorite books, TV shows, uh, etc. Torturers make mistakes all the time. They crack up. They screw up their grammar. They get their facts wrong. They use expressions or inflections uh, or uh, diction that's different than, than your own. How many uh, schizophrenics or AVH sufferers uh, hear voices that follow a strict protocol that restricts them from revealing any personal, personal information? These are the uh, sorts of uh, conversations and the sorts of items that are heard in everyday conversation. And in my case, we're talking about a million pages of uh, voices in my head that have followed precisely a strict protocol. Victims will be grateful for being given the chance to explain their treatments and stressors and or communicate the specific threats made against them or others to psychologists, psychiatrists, or the police. Torturers sometimes surface in public or uh, by providing information that could only have been gleaned by spying on somebody close uh, to the victim or spying on the victim. A torturer once through Voice to Skull told me that one of my friends who was helping me sell daily deals for pet family deals was going to quit and join his friend's online golf tea time scheduling business. A week later, my friend called and said, Chris, I have to quit so I can work on my friend's online business, which schedules tea times. I had never heard of this, uh, of his friend uh, or his friend's business until the voice the scholars mentioned it. In another surfacing, a guy walked right up to me at a bus station wearing a t-shirt that had the Manchurian Candidate Project embroidered, embroidered right, on, uh, right, above, uh, right on his chest and started laughing at the same time the voice the scholars did, meaning he could hear my tortures. The protocol creates an interesting dilemma for psychologists and psychiatrists like Dr. Lorraine Sheridan, who conducted a study of 128 targeted individuals but didn't ask a single one if their voices spoke other languages or mentioned things that ended up coming true because they, were, they had uh, hacked their uh, email uh, or mispronounced words or uh, never reveal their personal information, where they were going to lunch that day, where they went to college, where they grew up, any information about their family or friends, or confronted them in person, like uh, I just uh, described it happening to me. Dr. Sheridan is quoted in the New York Times by writer Mike McFaith 
as saying, when referring to support groups for victims of electromagnetic uh, attacks and organized stalking, what's scary for me is that there are no counter sites that try to convince targeted individuals that they are delusional. And these are the sites that are keeping uh, targeted individuals from killing themselves, Dr. Sheridan. I really hope Dr. Sheridan interviews my perpetrators before concluding ever again that people like me are in a closed ideology echo chamber. And with regard to uh, Dr. Sheridan, and with regard to Dr. Sheridan, I would uh, like to challenge Dr. Sheridan to uh, uh, contact uh, me and my perpetrators, and I'll give her the full names of my perpetrators, so that she can conduct a study. Uh, and in that study, she can uh, ask my perpetrators if they would take a voluntary uh, lie detector test, the P300 lie detector test, uh, with questions such as, uh, are you involved in game stalking Chris? Uh, are you aware of the uh, neural uh, weapons experimentation being conducted on Chris? Are you aware of any experimentation being conducted on Chris? Questions like this would do a lot to um, uh, convince the people who uh, watch this testimony or share this testimony that uh, you're a serious individual who's really trying to uh, differentiate um, between uh, mental illnesses and people put into non-consensual testing. If you've refused to do this, Dr. Sheridan, you are guilty of conspiracy. Voice to skull torture is a long-term experiment for the purposes of gathering data for neuroweapons research. Combined with gaslighting, these experiments can become organized attempts at driving an already helpless victim out of their job or home or bilk them out of money. America's decision to contract out their neuroweapons research and protect the identities of the perpetrators created a free-for-all for the individuals being paid to collect, to collect the data. Voice to Skull nowadays frames all the blood sciences, from altruistic brain research to psychotronic and neuroweapons technology as schizophrenic voices. Everybody has jumped on the bandwagon and are using the empathy gap to make it possible for themselves and others to feel no pain as they rape and pillage people's minds for money and prestige, knowing there are no consequences. By the end of 2006, I knew things weren't going to change unless I did something.